Good morning, church family. It is such a pleasure to be with you again this morning. And we're going to sing a few songs in a moment. But first of all, I'm going to read from Psalm 110. Please do grab a Bible, look it up on your, fo- on your phone. That's Psalm 110. I'll be reading from the New King James, um, and we'll start reading now. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. You have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. You shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. And we're going to sing to this Lord who reigns supreme over all other kings and countries. Um, Join with us as we sing now. this morning that our life is hidden with you that we have been made one with yourself by your blood that has cleansed us from all sin because of what you did our life is hidden with you where you are 
that our life is hidden and safe with you, our Saviour and our God. Father, we praise you for this. Help us to see you rightly this morning, to know that we sing before the throne of God himself. Um, Father, be with us this morning. Fix our hearts, our eyes on you as we sing, as we pray, as we read together, as we hear your word preached. Be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for a new day. Thank you for your compassion and mercies that are new every morning. 
Great is your faithfulness and your steadfast love. Thank you, Lord, for your mighty hands on us individually and as a church. We thank you for many blessings, seen and unseen. We pray, Lord, for forgiveness of sins. We pray that our sin will not be a barrier to our prayer in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, that the lockdown is gradually easing up. We pray, Lord, for an end to this pandemic so that our lives will return to normal and we'll be able to see each other again. We pray, Lord, that you give the government the wisdom to come to a decision that will work for everyone. Lord, you are God that is interested in all aspects of our lives. Please, Lord, meet us all at our point of need, whatever the need may be. We pray that the pandemic will bring awakening to the wonders of your salvation, in Jesus' name. Lord, as you speak to us today through your Son, we pray that your word will accomplish the purpose for which it is sent. We pray we will be convicted and we will be doers of your word and not hearers only. Lord, we trust that you will be faithful to complete the, great, the good work you started. This we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's reading church is taken from Daniel chapter 7 from the New King James Version. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion, and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had a huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there, in this horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near, before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. 
I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit, within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts which are four are like four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured, broke in pieces and trampled the residue with its feet, and the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints, and prevailing against them, until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favour of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings, who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints, of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion, to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion, and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven, shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High, His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. Amen. Morning, church. Um, uh, Welcome again uh, as we go through and continue through our series in the book of Daniel uh, as has just been uh, read uh, for us. Uh, Before we dive in, uh, please let's pray. Oh Lord, we are reminded as we come before your word that this is fundamentally a spiritual thing. I'm just so reminded, Lord, of how much we need your spirit to do the work. All the work through the text, all the teaching, all the things, all the listening, all of these things come to naught unless you help us by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, what we need to see is we need to see your glory. Well, our minds are so clouded with the things of this world. We are so into these things. And, and, and if we're not careful, these things, they dull your glory. They, they, we don't see your glory as we ought to. But Lord, I pray that you would pass through our cloudy vision and you would give us a vision of yourself and a vision of your glorious Son through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. There are different ways of communicating. There are many different ways of communicating. Uh, You know, I think the experts now talk about how, you know, there's so many different ways people communicate. You know, there's body language and there's all kinds of ways we communicate to to people. Uh, We don't just communicate with words. And one of the ways we communicate is we can often communicate with pictures. 
There's that old saying that says, a picture speaks a thousand words. In other words, when you see a picture, a picture can communicate things that you would spend thousands of words trying to explain. Right? Pictures, a picture can speak a thousand words. An image can speak a thousand words. And there's a sense, if you've been with us, following us in the series through the book of Daniel, there's a sense in which we are moving from words to pictures or to images. The first six chapters of the book of Daniel are narratives, they're stories about words. But from here onwards in the book of Daniel, we are all looking at visions. The second half of the book of Daniel is full of visions. They are images. And these images, they're they're symbolic. And, And the goal of these images is to give us a certain vision. It's to give us a certain image. It's almost as if God knows that in the middle life, in the middle of life in this fallen world, we need a different vision. We need another image in our minds. But the main point of these images, these visions, is to give us a heavenly perspective on what's going on here on the earth. God wants to give us a different image, right? An image that communicates more than a thousand words. I'm going to try and talk about the image in Daniel 7. But if I spoke forever, I couldn't explain all the things that we see in the image that we are given. But I want us to be clear. The main point of these visions is the main point we've already seen in the narratives. God in his wisdom, he's given narratives so that we can understand very clearly what the main point is. So that when we see the visions, we have a way of understanding the visions. Right? So we don't look at the visions of Daniel and and go off on our wild ideas. No, we look at the visions and what we see is that the main point is the main point we've already seen. That although the people of God will suffer under cruel and unjust governments, and people and kings. God is sovereign and he is bringing about his kingdom. That's the main point of the visions too, all the visions. Every single time we gather to discuss Daniel, that's what we're going to see. But the emphasis of Daniel 7 is that this coming kingdom of God is the coming kingdom of his son, the son of man, Jesus Christ. So that's what we're going to see. What we're going to see as we go through Daniel 7 is that although the people of God are oppressed by the kingdoms of this world and and by the Antichrist, who is a king of this world, God is sovereign and the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man are seated on the throne. And because of that, those who persevere will inherit the eternal kingdom with him. So, so the, what we're going to see, the people of God are, are persecuted by the Antichrist and the kingdoms of this world. And yet, because the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man are seated in glory, we can be assured that if we continue to hold on to faith, we will reign with him. So firstly, we see the power of the world empires and the power of this Antichrist. Look at me at verses 1 through 3. We'll start there. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And the four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. When we look at the way in which this language is interpreted, these beasts that you see are clearly kingdoms. They're they're world empires. If you remember what we said about the structure of the book of Daniel a few weeks ago, Daniel 7 has a parallel in Daniel 2. These beasts are kingdoms that have somewhat seemingly universal power. That the kind of kingdoms that we've seen through the book of Daniel that often set themselves as substitutes or alternatives to God. 
But here in Daniel 7, they're described as beasts. And I think the reference to this language of beast is meant to remind us all the way, take us all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, where we are told that the serpent is this beast, the most cunning of the beasts. And we see how the serpent leads Adam and Eve to rebel against God and therefore turn this, this whole world into ruin, right? The fallenness of this world, the brokenness of this world is because of what happened when that beast, the serpent, spoke with Adam and Eve and caused them to turn away from God. And so these kingdoms are these beasts, these world empires, who, who in one sense play God, they act as substitutes for God. And so you see the first beast, and, and the first beast is clearly the Babylonian Empire. The first beast is represented by a lion. Uh, we're told in Daniel 2 that first king, the first kingdom, the head of gold, that's, that's Babylon, that's Nebuchadnezzar. And, and we see elsewhere in scripture that the language of lions and the language of eagles is used specifically for the Babylonian Empire. After the Babylonian Empire, you have the Medo-Persian Empire, which comes in through King Cyrus, and that's represented here by a bear. There's a bear, and the bear represents this next world empire. After that, you have the Greek empire, represented by a leopard. And then finally, there is this fourth and last empire. There is this fourth beast. And the emphasis, you, you begin to zoom in when you look at this fourth beast. In fact, this fourth beast is so scary that if you notice, Daniel doesn't describe it as an animal. The only thing Daniel can say is that this beast is terrifying and it's dreadful. And this fourth empire we know is the, the Roman Empire. That's the empire that came after the, the, Greece, the Greek Empire. And there's this focus on this fourth empire. But you know, the focus on the fourth empire is actually really not so much on the beast as it is on this little horn. If you go through the narrative, you see there's this emphasis on this little horn. Horns are, is, is an image, right? It's an image from the animal world. And, and basically, horns are symbols of power. If you're an animal and you have a big horn, that means you're the boss. Because basically, you use your big horn to attack the other animals. Animals fight with their horns. And so horn is a, is a symbol of, of power. And, and here it's clear that the horn is a picture of a king. But what's, what was special or distinctive about this little horn is that this horn is characterized by his oppression of God's people. So look with me at verses 19 through 21. Look at verses 19 through to 21. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet. And the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn, which came up, before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth, which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Look again, just down in verse 25, speaking again of this horn, we read, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saint shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. There's a lot we could say. There's a number of ways in which this horn is described. Uh, we're not going to spend too long thinking about this horn because next week there's another, the, Daniel 8 talks again about a little horn and, and we're going to spend more time thinking about what that means. But 
Suffice it to say that when you look at what Daniel 7 says about this little horn, it's clear that what we're looking at is the person of the Antichrist. This little horn is said to be opposing the people of God. And when you look at the language that's used, it's the kind of language you see in the rest of the Bible, particularly in the book of Revelation, to refer to the Antichrist. And I want us to see a few things about this little horn. Firstly, we read that this little horn speaks great things or pompous things. In other words, he thinks he is greater than what he is. He's a powerful king, clearly. But he's a little horn in reality that's speaking great things. In other words, he's a king or ruler that imagines himself to be God. But he doesn't just make threats. He isn't just a talker. Verse 21 says, he prevails against the saints. He persecutes the people of God and he is winning. Verse 25 says that he will wear them out. That's the word literally. He wears out the people of God. That the people of God are given into his hand. He, he's persecuting the church and he's seemingly winning. And the primary way that he seems to be persecuting the church is by corrupting its worship. When it refers to, he shall, in verse 25, it says, he shall intend to change the times and law. This is language of worship, right? The, the worship times and the law of God. He will, he will change it. He will pervert it. He will corrupt the worship of God's people. And the temptation is, if, if, if this is true, if I'm right, and, and this is a reference to the Antichrist, the temptation then is for us to think of something that's going to happen sometime in the future. Some person in the future. And it is true to say that the Bible speaks of there will be this one figure, I think, at the end of all time that, that is a culmination of all of this. But the Bible is clear that the work of the Antichrist is in one sense true of the entire church age. That is, we are always facing the Antichrist. First John said, you've heard that there, that, that there is the Antichrist, but in truth, there are many Antichrists. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul tells us that the, the man of lawlessness is already at work. In other words, this great end time figure, you already see it now. Throughout the ages of the church, you see people who are pictures of this Antichrist. In other words, the church is always under attack. The church is always tempted to corruption. There's a sense in which the people of God are always being made to suffer. The people of God in this church age doesn't look glorious and amazing. It looks pitiful and weak. It's always under pressure, both externally and internally, right? There are always Christians who are dying for their faith, but also within the church, there's always corruption. There are always churches being set up which aren't churches. There are always people setting themselves up as if they were Jesus Christ. And this is a reality for the entire church age. And when you look at it from this angle, it all looks pretty horrific. The text says the little horn is prevailing over the people of God. It doesn't look hopeful. It looks like the people of God are losing. It looks like the people of God are the victims. But even as you look at this description of the little horn, even then, you, you already begin to see that there must be a different angle to this. You already begin to see that there is someone else at work. Because when you look at the way the Bible describes this little horn, what you see is that authority is given to the little horn. He's given authority. In fact, you're told that he's given, the people of God are given into his hand for a time. In other words, there is someone else who is at work here. There's, there's someone else who is sovereign here. 
And so in the midst of our despair, God gives us a different camera angle. Right? When you're looking at things here on the earth, it just seems as if this little horn is winning and the people of God seem pretty hopeless. But there is a different camera angle. There's a different angle to this. And in that different angle, we see God. And when we see God, what we see is Father and Son. What we see is the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man. And it's because of this different camera angle that we as believers can be assured of our victory. Look with me at verses 9 through 12. I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. In the midst of the persecution of the people of God, it's almost as if the camera goes up so that we see what's happening in heaven. And the first thing you see in heaven is the Ancient of Days. This title, Ancient of Days, means that he is the eternal one. See these beasts, there's one beast and then there's the next beast and there's this, this kingdom and then there's the next kingdom, right? They're bound in time, but there is one that is called the Ancient of Days. He's eternal. There never was a time when he was not. There was never a time when he did not reign. Always has been, always will be. He, he's the Ancient of Days. And he's righteous. You see these beasts, they're, they're wicked, they're evil, but he's righteous. And you see that because his clothes are white and his hair is white. In other words, there's not a single speck of sin or wickedness or oppression in him. He's perfectly righteous. And in addition to that, he's seated on a throne. And in other words, forget what you see on the earth. He's the one who's truly king. And he's surrounded by millions of angels who live to do his will. He's sovereign. This ancient of days is sovereign. But then lastly, he is pictured with fire coming from him. There's fire that comes from him. And this is a clear picture of judgment. This one, this ancient of days, has the power to judge and in times like this we we desperately need to hold on to this many of us probably most of us would have seen the video um, of a man in America being choked to death by a police officer as he, as he pleaded, as he pleaded for his life, he was choked to death by a police officer. This is one of the most horrific things I've ever seen. And there are many horrific things to be seen. And you, what, if you've seen this video, again, I'm not saying that not everyone, probably not everyone should watch this video. And you watch the video, it's minute after minute of this man's life being taken from him. As not only he pleads, but other people plead with this police officer. This police officer who's, who lives to, meant to serve this man, whose authority is meant to be used to protect this man. Rather, he, he, he is choking this man. And he's doing this in broad daylight. And it makes us angry, right? If you watch this, it makes you angry. And it makes you angry because it's so unjust. 
And again, just as with the little horn, it seems as if evil is prevailing and there's no one to do anything about it, right? It, it looks like justice will not be served. And when you look at that and you see video after video of that, and, and not just that, and you think of the injustice in this world, and the wickedness that happens in this world, you can begin to lose hope. You can begin to despair. But, you know, that's why God gives us a different camera angle. That's why we need to be reminded that what we see here on this earth is not all that there is. We must be reminded that in heaven there is one called the Ancient of Days. And that one sees all. Verse 10 says, when he sits down to judge, the books are opened. The great hope of justice for the Christian is that the day of judgment is coming. We know that this world is broken and wicked and unjust. We, we, we know that. We, we fight for justice in this world, but we are fully aware that our final hope for justice doesn't lie here in this world. It lies on the day to come. You, you fight for just judges and, and just MPs and senators and presidents and prime ministers, but we do not put our final hope in those men and women. We don't. We put our hope in the ancient of days. Because there was a God who was seated on his throne and justice is coming. It's coming. It's more sure than the, the sun rising and setting. It's more solid than the ground on which you stand on. The universe would sooner collapse in on itself than the God of justice, the ancient of days, not judge. Justice is coming. He's the one who sees all things. He doesn't even just see the actions. He sees through us. He sees the motivations of our hearts. Evil will not prevail because the Ancient of Days is still sitting on the throne. What that means is that the church, even in the midst of persecution, even when the church sees injustice, we grieve, we grieve with the world, but we do not grieve without hope. We don't grieve without hope. We grieve, but we do not despair. We're angry, but we're not consumed by our anger because we know that the Ancient of Days is sitting on his throne and fire goes up from before him and he will judge. He will judge. And the vision could have ended there, right? The vision could have ended there with the Ancient of Days and the promise of this great judge, judgment. But the vision doesn't end there. There's someone else. There's someone else. There's the Ancient of Days, but there's someone else. The Son of Man. Look with me at these verses, verses 13 and 14. We've been looking at them every week. Every week we've been doing Daniel. But look with me as we finally get to talk through it. Daniel says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Who is this son of man? Well, first, um, first glance, you might think the son of man is just a human. Right? At the end of the day, the, a son of man is, uh, I guess, a man. Right? Is, is, maybe this is just a human being. But we can tell already that this can't be the case. Because the Son of Man, we are told, is riding on the clouds. You see, in, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, you see several language of, some, of someone riding on the clouds. But the only person who rides on the clouds in all of the Bible is Yahweh. Yahweh alone rides the clouds. And yet the Son of Man, he's riding the clouds. Not only that, but the Son of Man reigns, we are told, he receives the kingdom and reigns forever. But that's weird because Daniel 2 has told us that the kingdom, the only kingdom that will last forever, is the kingdom of God. Right? 
at the end of this chapter, verse 27, we, are, we see that people's nations and languages, they serve the Ancient of Days, the Most High. But here in verse 14, we are told that they serve the Son of Man in the same way that they serve the Most High. In fact, the word for you to serve here in verse 14, in the book of Daniel, it always means worship. It's the word used in chapter 3 when Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego say, we will not serve or we will not worship this statue that you have built because we worship Yahweh. The Son of Man receives worship from all peoples, nations and languages. So this Son of Man is no mere human being. This Son of Man is God. And yet, he comes to the Ancient of Days, who is also clearly God. And already we are entering into the mystery of the Trinity, the, this one God but three persons. This worship that belongs to the, to the Ancient of Days also belongs to the Son of Man, and yet they are one. They are one. The kingdom belongs to the one who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. That's what Revelation says. This, this eternal kingdom belongs to the Ancient of Days and it belongs to the one like the Son of Man. And you know what? All of this is amazing enough. It's amazing enough. It's amazing enough that in the midst of persecution and, and oppression, there is the Ancient of Days, and there is the Son of Man. That's amazing enough. But there's something even more crazy, if you ask me. Look with me at verses 26 to 27. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion, that's the dominion of the little horn, to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High, his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. It's easy to miss this, but you know what? We, we, we can't miss this. The eternal kingdom belongs to the Ancient of Days. We see that in verse 27. That same kingdom belongs to the Son of Man. But the amazing thing here is, verse 27 says, that kingdom shall be given to the people, the saints, will inherit this kingdom. The amazing thing is that when this, this kingdom, this eternal kingdom, one day that belongs to Jesus Christ, one day will belong to all those who are united with him in faith. We will reign with Jesus Christ. Look, you might have heard that before. Maybe you, you, you've thought about it before. But that's, that's amazing. Right? It would be amazing to think that we serve under all these governments who are inherently corrupt, inherently unjust. It would be amazing to say that one day God is going to come right? and God, God will bring his kingdom fully here on earth. And we will be subjects of a great and good and loving king. And if all we were were subjects in this kingdom, that would be amazing. But Daniel 7 says we're not just subjects of this kingdom. Daniel 7 says we will reign in that kingdom. Because what is true of Jesus Christ will be true of us. We are one with him in faith. You know, the oneness of marriage, the only reason why marriage exists is to point to the oneness that believers have with Jesus Christ. And because the Son of Man is reigning, because the kingdom belongs to him, we too one day will reign with him. There's that scene, I think I've mentioned it before, where in Lion King, where Mufasa takes Simba and he shows him, you know, he's talking to him and he's like, all that the light can see will one day belong to you. He's showing Simba all that he will inherit because Simba is, he's going to reign, right? He's going to inherit the kingdom. Well, everything in this universe will belong to those who are trusting in Jesus Christ. Every star that no human eye has ever seen, every planet that you've not yet imagined, all of it, all of it, will belong to us. We will reign with Christ because it belongs to him. 
What's true of him will be true of us. The kingdom belongs to Jesus Christ. And that's a plea for believers to not give up. We live in the time period where the, we are faced with persecution and oppression. And the work of the Antichrist. But God promises that the kingdom of the ancient of days, which is the kingdom of the Son of Man, one day we will reign with the Son of Man forever. You know, we often think of this coming of the Son of Man, the Son of Man receiving this kingdom and his glory. We often think of it in terms of the second coming. And you know, that's, that's true. There, there's some relevance to that. That's, that's true. But I want us to see that primarily this this picture of the Son of Man receiving kingdom and glory and dominion, primarily it's referring to the first coming. And you see the fulfillment of this in Matthew 28. It's, it's referring to what Jesus did when he came and lived and died and rose again and ascended. Because the coming of the Son of Man in Daniel 7 is he comes to the Ancient of Days and receives this. You see, this passage is fulfilled when you look at Matthew 28 and Jesus, after the resurrection, can say, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus says, I've done it. I'm king. Jesus comes as this king. He says, the kingdom of God, he said, he's reigning. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. He can say that because through his death and resurrection, he has defeated sin and death and the devil. He's won. He's Lord. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. But do you remember what the application of that is? In Matthew 28, he says, therefore go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. We go. The way in which we recognize the Lordship of Jesus Christ is that we go. And the reason for that is Daniel 7. If the Son of Man has received dominion and glory and a kingdom, Daniel 7 tells us the purpose of that is so that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. That, that's the implication of the fact that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, is that all peoples, nations, and languages to serve him. And you know, Revelation 7 tells us that one day that will be completely fulfilled. That one day every single tribe and tongue and nation will be gathered around the throne in worship of Jesus Christ. But we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And the way in which we get there is by believers going and making disciples of all nations. If you're a believer, one of the applications of Daniel 7 is evangelism. It's to go forth and tell our neighbours. And, and yes, it's world missions. That's true. But, you know, especially for those of us who live in London. We have the nations here. It's to go forth and tell our colleagues and our friends and our neighbours that Jesus is Lord. And, you know, we can do that in confidence. We can do that knowing that we will get results. We can go to any place in the world and know that God will draw people to himself. And you know the reason why we can do that? We, we can do that because the Son of Man is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is Lord. And so all peoples, nations and languages will, will, will come to him and serve him. Church, we're not there yet. Right? We have to go. We must go. But you know the fact that today there will be people from England and Jamaica and Wales and Nigeria and Ghana and India and Russia and Morocco and Iran and Iraq and Brazil and Argentina and Somalia and New Zealand. There will be people from all those countries and countless more who will gather to worship or at least in their homes they will worship Jesus Christ. The fact that that's the case is all the proof we need to know that the Son of Man is seated at the right hand of the Father. It's all the proof we need to know that Jesus is exalted. The fact that Jesus is Lord, that he still lives and reigns, is seen in the fact that there are people from countless nations who recognize that Jesus is Lord. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not end, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. 
And if you're not yet a part of this kingdom, then the plea, my plea for you is to recognize that Jesus is Lord. It might seem that there's nothing glamorous about the Christian life now. You look at your, your, your friends who are Christians, doesn't look like they don't have more money than you. They're not doing any better in life than you. In fact, maybe they're doing a lot worse than you. Their lives look pretty shabby. But the promise of the Bible, the promise of Daniel 7, is that Jesus is coming again to fully establish his kingdom here on earth. And on that day, on that day, those who are trusting in him will reign with him for all eternity. Remember what we saw, justice is coming. The day of judgment is coming. And that's bad news for every single person because we've all sinned, we've all turned away from God. And God sees through us, he sees our actions, he sees our motivations. And the only way that day could be good news to us is if we've trusted in Jesus Christ. If our sins have been washed away through the blood of his son. The reality of the coming kingdom means that we must repent. And when you repent, you can know that you will reign with Jesus Christ forever. Finally then, the, the book of Revelation is the final book uh, in the Bible. And in the book of Revelation, there are some amazing promises about what the new heavens and the new earth will look like, what God's kingdom will look like. We're told that there will be no more crying, there will be no more sorrow, there will be no more death. Amazing promises. But you know, one of the weirdest promises of all is that there will be no longer a sea. There'll, the sea will be no more, we are told. And you're like, okay, how does that fit? Especially you guys that are like outdoors people. You like the sea. You like seeing the sea. And oh, why, is there, why is there no more sea, right? That, that doesn't seem to fit. But again, this is imagery. We, we saw it in Daniel 7. And you see it again in the book of Revelation. The place where the beasts come from is the sea. The sea is a picture in the Bible of this place where the opposition to God comes from. Where the beast comes from. But we're told in Revelation that on that day, there will no longer be any sea. Because on that day, there won't just be, God doesn't just promise us that there won't be any evil. What God is saying is, there won't be the possibility of evil. He's not just saying there will no longer be a beast. He's saying there will be no sea for the beast to come out from. On that day, basically, what he's saying is that when we live with Jesus Christ, when we reign with him for eternity, we won't be looking over our shoulder, scared about what might happen with a new serpent or a new beast or new sin. No, evil will be totally eradicated and the possibility of evil will be eradicated. For the sea will be no more. And sin will be no more, and the beast will be no more, and injustice will be no more, and death will be no more, and there will be no more tears or sorrow. For the Ancient of Days will reign, and the Son of Man will reign, and those who are trusting in him will also reign with him. Let's pray. Gracious God, um, Lord, in the middle of suffering and despair, in the middle of physical pain and mental health, in the middle of oppression and injustice, in the middle of much confusion and much false teaching, we are in the middle of all those things and so much more. Give us a vision of heaven. Help us to see that you are still on your throne. Help us to see that you, your son is coming again. Help us to know that your promise is not empty. That that day of peace is coming and give us the strength to hold on. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen.
Um, Tuesday, we'll have our prayer meeting as usual. Um, um, uh, please let's gather to pray. Uh, um, especially now, we, we need to be praying. We always need to pray, but I think we've been reminded of the brokenness of this world. And apart from God, we have nothing in this world. Let's, let's pray. Tuesday, we'll be on Zoom. Um, contact um, maybe on the Facebook, on the Instagram, if you, if you need a link to that. Wednesday, uh, we'll be starting our new series, really exciting, called Big Questions. We need your help for it, uh, where we're going to basically do a series where we tackle some of your questions, the questions that people have. We'll make a series of it. So we'll take our first question this Wednesday and we'll spend the teaching portion just dealing with that one question, um, looking through the Bible, what the Bible holistically has to say about it. And then we'll spend the second half as we normally do in a kind of open Q&A. And then next week, uh, we'll be in Daniel chapter 8, continuing our series through the book of Daniel. Um, we'll end, we'll close um, as we've closed throughout this series, uh, but hopefully with more joy uh, now that we've looked through it than ever before. We'll close with Daniel 7, 13 to 14. Uh, if you can, read it with me. I'll be reading from the NKJV. And then at the end, we'll just say, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Read it with me if you can. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Take care and God bless.